looking at a joint distribution of two continuous random variables. And so uh, we're taking X and Y. Usually they're going to be distributed normally. Let's put some context here. Let's say we're working for a very cheap sailboat manufacturer and they have people in the mast department that they're, when the boat gets them, they have to put the mast in the middle of the sailboat up and the times it takes to put the mast in are normally distributed with a mean of 50 minutes and a deviation of four minutes. The people in this department have to put the seats on the sailboat and the times it takes them to accomplish that task are normally distributed with a mean of 45 minutes and a standard deviation of three minutes. And I think you know where I'm going with this. this. These people, if they don't do quality work and they only put in like a portion of the mast, they can get fired for doing a half mast job. And these guys got to be worried about theft because their job is to put the seats in. What if they have some friends over for lunch and they say, hey, have a seat. You know, the inventory's missing. These guys can get accused. But have no fear, if they lose their jobs in these departments, I hear that there's a future in sales. So anyway, it's this sailboat company. Uh, they got these uh, normally distributed times. And what we're going to do then, we're going to say, we're going to randomly select one time to put the mast in, one time to put the seat in. What's the probably the sum of the times is at most 90 minutes. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get this joint distribution. When we're trying to combine these two things, we can't just deal separate with this distribution and separate with this. We have to take the information and combine them into a new joint distribution. We'll call that the sum of x and y. So this is a family of the infinitely many times that we could combine. This joint distribution will be distributed normally with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 45. We're going to add these two together. Now, this will always be true that you can combine the means together regardless of whether the two random variables are independent. But the only way that we can have confidence about the variability in selecting the times is if we know that the two random variables are independent of each other. Independence is a huge idea going all the way through probability and statistics. So unless we can figure out, decipher, or we are told that the two random variables are independent, we aren't going to know exactly how we can bring the standard deviations together. Now here's the other thing. Means are one thing. Remember, means are measures of center. So on average, 50 minutes here, 45 minutes here. But remember that standard deviation variance, that's something totally different. Those are measures of spread. So what you want to understand is, it'd be nice to understand, that every time we select a score from here, there's a certain variability. It's what random chance is. People call it luck. We call it standard deviation. It's how much fluctuation we get from sample to sample. The selection here has some fluctuation, and the selection from this distribution has some fluctuation. But a lot of that fluctuation and spread, that variance, they can offset each other. For example, hopefully it makes sense to us that we could get an unusually long time over here to put a seat in, and then come over here and have one of the shorter amounts of time to put the mast in so that when you add these totals together, you might have a time down here in the low 40s and a time up here at about 50, but when you add them together, you get a result in the low 90s. In other words, this random fluctuation that was high counteracts with this random fluctuation that's low. They balance each other out, and in the end, we're gonna get a result that's pretty close to 50 plus 45, that's pretty close to the 95. If that didn't make sense, let's put some numbers to it. Let's suppose this is 51, it's well above the mean there. And this guy down here, maybe this guy is like 42. So well below the mean, well above the mean there. But when we add them together, when we, oh, this should be a Y, sorry, that's a little Y. When we add our one little X to our one little Y, we get 42 plus 51, we get 93. 93 is not far off from the joint distribution, which would have a mean of 50 plus 45, it would have a mean of 95. So even though we had some serious fluctuations, some variance there, some serious variance there, they counteract each other and the net result may be that we get a score that's not that far from the mean in the joint distribution. Because of that, we don't just add the four and the three together to get a new standard deviation for the joint distribution of seven, because of these um, offsetting situations where we can negate the, the variance if it's going in opposite directions. So for that reason, it makes sense that we should be doing something different 
to find the new standard deviation of the joint distribution besides adding those two guys together. Well, as it turns out, in advanced statistics, you learn that the real parameters to these distributions are not the mean and the standard deviation, they're the mean and the variance. Because you can add the means together to get the new mean, and you can add the variances together to get the new variance, and that's legit, and then you can take the square root of that to get back to the new joint standard deviation. So this is why, this is a big idea, when you have joint distributions, then you can add the variances together to get the new variances, but take the square root of that to get it back down to the standard deviation. We see when we get to inference on sample means and proportions that the formulas for the difference of means and the difference of proportions, which are joint distributions, have us adding the variances together and then taking the square roots. If you look at those formulas carefully, that's what's going on. So, you're allowed to add the variances together to get the new variance, but you're not allowed to add the standard deviations together. Well, let's see what we get. Remember, if we add the standard deviations together, we get 7, but that's no good. That is not the new standard deviation. Well, what happens here? This Pythagorean triple. 16 plus 9 is 25. The radical of 25, square root of 25, is 5. So the joint distribution will have a standard deviation of 5. That makes sense. It's not as much as the 7 that we would get when we add the standard deviations together. Okay, so our joint distribution has a mean of 95 and a standard deviation of 5. So we got that joint distribution down here. The mean is 95, standard deviation is 5. We're trying to find the probability that we get at most 90 minutes. So at most 90 minutes to complete the task. That's the area of the curve right here. We can estimate that because do we notice that 90 is exactly one standard deviation below the mean? If we use the empirical rule and we have 68, but let's not, we could use normal CDF. But at any rate, trust me, you're going to get a, uh, an area under the curve that's pretty close to about 16%. It's going to be about 15.87%. So I think we're okay with doing Z scores and finding area under the curve. Our big thing in this video is to make sure we remember how to do the joint distributions. So this was our joint distribution here. Now, we go to a slightly more difficult problem, and it's when we take the difference in times. So what's probability that we take one of each of the two times, uh, we look at their difference, and the difference in times exceeds three minutes. And we're going to be told in the problem, hey, assume independence. So here we go. The joint distribution we need now is to take the difference in the two times. So we have to go to this new normal distribution, this new joint distribution down here, where it's the difference in the times, and it doesn't really matter which one you subtract from which. It probably makes more sense to take the longer time on average minus the smaller, so we're doing x minus y. So our new joint distribution has a mean difference of 5, but again, the standard deviation is 5. Don't subtract the variances if you're subtracting the times because subtraction is just dealing with on average what's happening. Th this is what's happening in the center. That's what the, that's what the new mean is. But the spread is still the spread. The spread is still much how much variance are you introducing each time you select a number. So it makes sense that variance, standard deviation, is always going to be a positive value. You're not going to be subtracting those. But so again, you add the variances together, get the new variance, but take the square root to get the standard deviation. This then is our joint distribution for the difference of the times. Every score in here is a difference in times. In fact, just as a point of reference, zero should make sense to us. On this uh, joint distribution, zero would imply that whatever, however long it took us to put the mast in, it took the same amount of time for us to put in the seats that one time because the difference of the two times is zero. Uh, so this joint distribution, these are differences of times. If we're answering the question, what's probably that the difference in times exceeds three minutes, we could find three minutes here, and we'd find the area under the normal curve above three minutes. Z-score would be negative 0.4, where 0.4 standard deviations left of the, the mean. And the uh, we could use the normal CDF if we wanted to, we get this probability right here. And if we're not careful, we'd stop and we'd say, I believe our work here is done. We feel pretty good about what we've done. But wait a minute, if we're not careful, we could make a boo boo. The difference in the times exceeds three minutes in two different scenarios. If the mast time minus the 
seat time is greater than three minutes, that's one thing. And remember the mass times were longer, so we might get a mass time that was like 52 and a seat time that was maybe uh, 48, and certainly that difference is a plus four. But it's possible that we could get one of the lower mast times. Let's go back over here. What if we got one of the mast times that was, uh, oh, we'll say down here at about 47. So we got 47 for a mast time. And over here, how long it took to put in the seats? I don't know, maybe somebody was uh, smoking a cigar or something. I don't know, and it took them a little bit longer to, to put that in. Maybe they actually got a 52 over here. Well, if you do a 47 for this guy, minus a 52 from that guy, that's normally a shorter amount of time, looky there, we get a negative five. Negative five minutes, but that is a difference in times of more than three minutes. So, we come back here and we say, you know what, we're not done. We found the probability that the mast time would exceed the time it took to put in the seats by at least three minutes, but we failed to consider the scenario where if we did this, the mass time minus the seat time, the seat time could take longer, leading to negative differences. So any negative difference that was a bigger negative than negative three or a smaller number than negative three would also come into play. So we could find the z-score here, which would be negative 1.6. We could do the normal CDF, and I just happened to crank that puppy out earlier. That's another five and a half percent added on to this guy. So our final answer is actually about, what is that, about 71% chance that the times would differ by more than three minutes. So joint distributions for uh, continuous random variables, this is the foundation for doing two sample inference on means and two sample inference on proportions because Look at those formulas on the formula sheets. They have you adding the variances together and then taking the square root. They're the difference of means and difference of proportions. So this concept is actually very important, very foundational for.